when controversies are mentioned in the country, he must be in one of them when it comes to politics. But he is a king that has built his own empire, not born in a rich family as many politicians have. Today allow me to take you down the memory lane and bring to you the story of the rise of the Matatu king from Matout, from become, being a beach boy in Mombasa to becoming the governor of Nairobi, Mike Bovisonko. Kenyan's capital, Nairobi, is one of the biggest cities in Africa. But Mike Bovisonko became the governor of Nairobi County, dethroning the then governor Evans Kidero, a man that associated himself with royalty and riches. In the mid-2010s, before his 40th birthday, Mike Bovi Gideon Kiyoko Sonko strangled Nairobi's Eastlands like a colossus, a king and his bugging fiefdom. Eastlands is many things, one among them being a constellation of colonial housing estates and their post independence imitations. Once upon a time, Eastlands was the hallmark of arrival for the black African elite. But on sizing state power, that gentry migrated en masse to Idato Europeans, only neighborhoods. Left to its own devices, soils of hub and ghettos beggared across Eastlands flats. Later attempts to urbanization yielded poorly designed high-rise residential structures made up of mostly cramped and poorly lit flats. Out of the dusty roads and lit streets and dried up taps came Sheng, a popular slang from an intricate mix of English, Kiswahili, and bits and pieces of other vernacular languages. The language paved the way for Kenyan's 90s rap culture, a punchy mimicry of American gangster rap, then led by Biggie and Tupac. Art, art forms such as graffiti pig banked the, on the music, with both the music and graffiti uh, finding their way into Matatus, the unruly public transport main buses that are a big was in Nairobi. This evolution saw Matatus move from plain looking jalopies into manyangas, cosy rhymes with the statues, bodyworks, and exteriors. And embellished with avant-garde artwork, blasting deafening music. Now, in the year 2010, when the rest of Nairobi and Kenya got to know him, the 35-year-old Mike Bovisonko was already the undisputed spring of Nairobi's Matatu subculture. He held a dozen of the swankiest in Ghana's, the Sheng word for Matatu's, it evolved from Manyanga in the 90s to Nganya in the 2000s and Choda mostly, most recently. These all pile Route, 9, Route 57 operating between downtown Nairobi and Buruburu shopping center, a busily congested hub populated with pubs, hypermarkets, and discotheques. The rule of matatu, for matatus is the more flagrant the better. So Mbuvi went all out, pioneering the installation of big screen TVs at the front of the passenger cabins of his 32 seater matatus and giving them names like Brown Sugar, Convict, Ferrari, Lakers, Rough Cuts, Commuters could now watch the music video as the song played. Mbuvi even had a double decker bus to his fleet affording Buruburu residents a lofty view as they transversed their city. Fumbu who just 12 years earlier was serving time in a maximum prison in Shimola Tewa, Mombasa, 
This was already a remarkable turnaround in fortunes. Few realized then that he was only just getting started. Born in Mombasa and bred in Kuala, Bubi Mike Sonko had been a resident of the two coastal towns for most of his life. His father ran a property broker, brokerage company, and the young Bovi doubled in the family business, but Bovi is willing and dealing occasionally across the line. In 1995, aged 20 and already making petty cash, Bovi was arrested and charged with assault. The following year, Sonko was charged with impersonation in the course of cutting his land deals. He was released on bail on both occasions. But he kept failing to appear in court, a practice that violated the terms of his bail and eventually in 1997 got him arrested and sentenced to six months in prison. Bovi was dispatched to, to Shimola Tewa Maximum Security Prison on 12th March 1998 as prisoner number P number Shimola Tewa 477-1998. After a month behind bars, he faint illness and was admitted at Coastal General Hospital in Mombasa from where he vanished on 16th April 1998. Only to reappear in Buruburu. Bovi's justification for keeping jail was that he needed to pay his last respect to his late mother, Saum Mukami, whose funeral he had missed while behind bars. But in reality, he just needed a fresh start. Speaking so early with a coastal hands, uh, accent, I mean, Bovi landed in Boroboro with a bomb. Together with his wife, Primrose, Bovi scrooged for capital and set up a hair saloon, a barber shop, a video library, a cyber cafe, and an outlet for selling carpets and clothes boutique. Being a fugitive, some cooperated in the shadows. Primrose ran the show, and the business flourished. The couple opened a popular nightclub, then ventured into the matatu business. Initially, Sonko couldn't afford ganyas, and so he settled for a cup of worn-out matatus, which he deployed into the deep of Islands in Dadora, a sprawling settlement that hosts Nairobi's largest dam site. It was while operating on the Islands back routes that Sonko gained a deep understanding of the business and the place. It was also around this time, age 25 in 2000, that Sonko got in trouble with the law again over yet another property deal gone wrong. While detained at Nairobi industrial area remand prison awaiting trial, wardens connected the dot backwards to Bovi's escape from Shimola Tewa prison in 1998 before Bovi knew what had transpired. He was moved to the more secure Kamete Maximum Prison. Soon, he was back at Shimola Tewa to complete his pending 12-month sentence. But after just nine months, he applied for a review of his sentence in his dramatic affidavit. Sonko claimed he was epileptic and HIV positive, as well as suffering from chronic tuberculosis and peptic ulcers. He was released on the strength of his supposedly dire medical condition and reported good behavior. Back in Buru, Primrose had grown their business. With satisfactory liquidity, it was now time to get into the top league of the Matato business, making it their main hassle. Sonko and Primrose Sonko accumulated a fleet of Nairobi's loudest and most dashing gunners. Thereby dominating the Buru route, money started streaming in by the bucket. The logic was simple. There is a hierarchy of ganyas, which works in the same fashion as music charts. The longer a song stays at top number one, the more the heart is turns. For ganyas, those at the top of the pecking order make more money a day by charging higher fares or making the highest number of road trips or both. The audacity to charge higher rates emanates from the fact that Ganyas always have a steady stream of passengers, call them fans or groupies, who will still put at the terminals until their favorite Ganya shows up. 
this group of commuters never mind paying some extra for their comfort, music choice, or prestige of riding their favorite Nganya. More importantly, Rene Nganyas manage to make as many round trips as possible because they are ordinarily exempted from certain protocols within the Matatu ecosystem, including the first come, first boarded rule at the pick up and drop of points. This meant that Whenever Songo's Ganyas got to downtown Nairobi, they skipped the queue, filled up instantly and turned around. The same applied when they arrived at Buru Shopping Center, never allowing the ignition to turn off as long as the Ganyas were on the move. Songo's bankers were elated. However, the biggest advantage Ganyas had was that they were a law unto themselves. In their pursuit of making as many road trip, round trips as possible, Ganyas overlapped, took shortcuts, bullied motorists out of lanes and occasionally drove on the wrong side of the road. All of these crested matatu madness by Nairobians was made possible through the collusion of traffic police who were on the payroll of matatu barons. According to Dale's some of Nairobi stop Ganyas. The routes they ply can't be named for fear of victimization. There has always ex existed a bribery ch f food chain. The top cops are paid monthly and the amount, the amount drops as one cascades down the rank. With the lowest hunters being roadside cops who take as little as half a dollar per Ganya per day. This rule breaking by Ganyas were deemed necessary considering it caused an harm and a leg to transform a regular minibus into a Ganya. Aside from making him incredible amounts of money, Sonko has previously estimated that on an average day at the head of the morning shift at midday, he, had, he would have a clean two uh, $200 per Ganya. So $200 per Ganya, when we speak about it in Kenyan shillings, that is about right now 20, about 20, 24,000 or 25,000 Kenyan shillings, that is in the mid morning, that is 20,000 per Ganya. And some quite about 50 or 100 of them. To run his ever-growing Matatu empire, Sonko recruited some of the shrendest youngsters around his lands to be his drivers, conductors, hangers-on, making him the leader of an influential network across Italy. It was in this era of Sonko's life that he had the nickname Sonko, which is shame for boys, or the moneyed one. Bovis other Monica, which was never said out loud, was Kabumba, a shame term insinuating black magic. Bovi's rise had been so meteoric that some onlookers suspected sorcery. These whispered rumors were partly fueled by the fact that he was born and bred at the coast and tapped into the popular myth that there is a powerful form of wizardry that draws its powers from the Indian Ocean. Mbuvi did little to discourage this impression. He donned gold rings, blazed with weird-looking and moustaches on all his fingers. Bling Bling believed to be the repository of voodoo magic powers. And so by the time a parliamentary by-election arose in Nairobi's Makandara constituency in April, 2010, Sonko was ready a powerhouse across Islands. More than being the flamboyant horn of the flashiest Ganyas in Nairobi, Bovi had reason to become a defender in chief of Islands Matatus, which had elected him the chairperson. When the government attempted to relocate the pickup and drop of points for Islands Matatus from central Nairobi to the edge of the city in 2007, Sonko went to court and successfully stopped the move. 
outside the Hislands, Songko was still an enigma. The mysterious owner of the infamous Raudi Buruma tattoos, but soon Nairobi could come to learn plenty more about him. Songko's interest in the Makadara by election was stirred by the fact that in his estimation no one had the kind of network, manpower and infrastructure he had across the cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan constituency that had Buru shopping centers its nerve center. If he activated his extensive web of drivers, conductors and hangers on, on his ganyas and decided to use his matatus as a campaign tool, he would be miles ahead of other candidates. Moreover, Sonko had stacks of ready to spend cash courtesy of his ganyas which is splashed around with Abaddon. Now Mbuvi immediately caused a splash in Nairobi usually stirred political scene. Who was the skinny lad on the billboard with the outrageous fashion sense? And who was he to call himself Sonko? That was the questions that rumored around the streets of Nairobi. But what quickly got out that Mbuvi hold the infamous Buru Ganyas and then it all made sense. The Ganyas made Buvi tons of money, hence Sonko, and being their proprietor called him immunity. From that point onwards and throughout his theatrical decades in politics, Sonko's multiple facts pass stood forgiven on account that he was the embodiment of Umatatu, an anarchist phenomenon character characterized by brash brashness of vulgarity and braggadocio and pers personified by the Matato Cruz. However, much as Matato brought Mbubi fame and fortune, it also attracted judgmental frowns. Kenyans established political parties wouldn't touch him despite Mbubi's repeated, uh, repeated uh, crime related cases that he had. So he did not play by the rules of the political elite and was not welcomed there. Despite going up against local MP, locals, Mbuvi won and Makandara had a new MP, the Mike Mbuvi Kiyoko Sonko, the boss of the Matatus. Mbuvi began his parliamentary term with a bang keen on leaving a quick mark, considering he had just more than two years before the 2013 general election, personifying the name Sonko, Bovi dished out bundles of crisp currency notes indiscriminately to dispute Nairobians whenever they caught his eyes or ear. Conveniently, broadcasting his generosity on social media to keep the streets talking, he rode around town in gold plate SUVs, wore kilos of gold, jewelry, and dyed his hair golden. This attracted plenty of attention, not all of it welcome. Three months after his election, police raided Sonko's office and Buru residence on suspicion that he was involved in drug trafficking. After a tip-off from the U.S. Embassy, the Minister for Internal Security honed up to Parliament about this leak from the Americans. Playing a hide-and-seek with the cops, Sonko complained bitterly to Parliament about police harassment. In a subsequent police report, detectives said that Sonko had been afraid to meet investigators. When he did, they said, he denied being a drug dealer, but did confess to taking part in a multi-million dollar large fraud syndicate an admission which the police didn't pursue further by charging Mbuvi with fraud. The scams involved working with government officials to grab parcels of land whose leases are about to expire and secretly transferring these title deeds from original owners to fraudsters who use them to con buyers. The report listed three companies, Kaswarina Club, Premix Enterprises, and Tungwa Brad Design. A business, as businesses registered under Bovi's name, none of which were duly paying taxes. Possibly, trying to protect her 
and their businesses. Mbubi told investigators that his wife, Primrose, was actually his sister. <laughs> now this is this is where it gets fun. Sonko is a man that will do anything to escape the law. Mm. Uh, this is back in 2010 where he confesses to the police that he, wait a minute, you mean Primrose? She is my sister, not my wife. And this is his wife. The report barely mentioned Bovi's Matatu Empire, except to observe that he operates several Matatus, Christian, a tour within Nairobi. Bovi did indeed operate two Ganyas named Atul, but the police were hinting at something. It was one of those, if you know, you know, scenarios. On November two, on tenth November two thousand five, two brash gold chain wearing Ar Armenians named Artur Magarian and Artur Sagarsian landed in Nairobi, posturing first as businessmen, then as playboys, and then as security experts. Over time, the pair cultivated connections at the highest levels of Kenyan society. Ultimately, they proved so useful to their collaborators in whatever shadow shenanigans they were involved in and that they were both appointed as deputy commissioners of police. Their tools were reportedly linked to drug dealing by Kenyan journalists. Remember the story of the two Armenians by Jichopev then Mohammed Ali, the current member of parliament of Nyali constituency in Mombasa County as a journalist there. Now, continuing, by pointedly mentioning his Ganyas named Artur, even writing Artur in capital letters, they seemed to be implying that even if he weren't guilty, Mbuvi's fondness for suspected dealers was a telltale sign. Deserved or not, the drug dealer label stuck to Bovi Sonko. Perhaps that's why he decided to formally change his name in 2012 from Bovi Gideon Kiyoko to Bovi Gideon Kiyoko Mike Sonko. Mm. Not that it seemed to do him any harm. His popularity, his popularity was skyrocketing with the name Sonko, I mean. Bovi saw the drug trafficking allegations as a warning shot and knew he needed to find political protection first. Similarly, his by-election win didn't guarantee future political success, particularly as he had now set his sights on becoming the first ever senator for Nairobi County. He needed to align himself with one of the top political parties. This time, his timing was exactly right. Uhuru Kenyatta, and then one of two deputy prime ministers was about to run for president on the National Alliance Party ticket. Kenyatta, a son of Kenyan's founding father, Jomo Kenyatta, is political royalty. But he had a major problem and needed all the friends he could find. Kenyatta was one of the four Kenyans facing criminal charges against humanity at the International Criminal Court in the head. This stemmed from the 207 to 208 post-election violence in which more than a thousand people are thought to have been killed. Bufi cast himself as Kenyatta's defender-in-chief, mourning more than the, br uh, the brethren. Bufi went as far as asking his barber to carve Kenyatta's name on his head. He flew to the head to lead demonstrations in support of Kenyatta whenever he appeared in court, always wearing a t-shirt emblazoned with ones, respect our president, taka taka gesia, respect our president, you pieces of... Yeah. <laughs> Mbubi's support for Kenyatta paid off. During the 2013 general election, Kenyatta and the running mate then, William Ruto, currently the president of Kenya, was also facing crime charges against humanity at the head, won the presidency by a super slim margin. Cases against both leaders were subsequently dropped. 
riding this wave, Mbove became Nairobi's inaugural senator with the staggering 808,705 votes, the highest number of votes ever cast in Kenya for a single politician who wasn't running for president. Mbove was unstoppable. Like most of the new senators elected, Sonko realized he might have made a miscalculation. Much as the title is gradius, the job itself is limited to oversight. The real power lay with governors who controlled huge budgets and could therefore affect lives and livelihoods. So Sonko hatched a plan. He established a privately funded pro bono service delivery engine known as the Sonko Rescue Team, which comprised of ambulances, fire agents, and water bosses. He enlisted the, service, the services of hundreds of youth to operationalize the entity and asked them to pick up later at the same time. He got the new organization to pay the medical bills of those needing specialized treatment in Kenya and abroad. And in the misfortune, in the unfortunate event of passing on, Mbovi used his famous Boruganyas as free hisses. No one, and I mean no one, including the incubate then Nairobi governor Dr. Evans Kidero, could compete with my Sonko apparent generosity. Critics questioned how Sonko could afford all this given that he had less than $10,000 a month as a senator. Sonko brushed off the haters. He told the city that he would be Nairobi's next governor, and at a public rally declared himself to be Kenyan's third most powerful man. Behind only the president and his deputy, he was not afraid to use his power. Whenever a government official got in his way, Sonko would get Kenyatta on the phone putting the call on loudspeaker as the ever-present media cameras all. Taking their cue from their incorrigible boss, bosses, bo Sonko's bodyguard started showing up in public spaces welding AK-47s as if operating in a war zone. At a Senate meeting, Sonko attempted to get into a fist fight with Kidero, the man he wanted to unseat. None of these hurt him. Sonko was untouchable for now. Operation Stop Sonko. As much as the ordinary non challenged Kenyatta didn't seem bothered by Sonko Matatu, allowing his anarchist tendencies to slide on repeated occasions, a courtier of senior civil servant felt differently. They were worried what would happen if he became Nairobi's next governor. Working with Kenyan's wealthiest business people, they hatched what would become known as Operation Stop Mbuvi, as an intervention that Sonko himself lamented about publicly time and again whenever he experienced state harassment. Stopping Sonko involved a series of legal and technical roadblocks that would make him ineligible to run for office. First prize would be ensuring that Sonko didn't obtain a certificate of good conduct from the police given his criminal record, this ought to have been an easy win. However, the conspirators back these up with their own candidate, Peter Kenneth, a man who Sonko kept referring to as the system's candidate. Kenneth was, a different, was different from Mike Sonko as day is from night. Well connected in all the right circles of business, politics, and high society. Two funerals that took place after the 2017 general election showed that showed the Kenyan public Kenneth possibilities. A funeral, they say, reveals more about a society than any other occasion. The first was the non-state state funeral of Bob Colimo, the Kenyanized. Guyanese chief executive of Safaricom, the Vodacom found in telecommunication behemoth that is Kenyan's most profitable company. As much as he was a private corporate citizen, Colimo's passing commanded national mourning. 
considering that being Safaricom CEO, at least if one understands the role, its trappings and leverage and acts accordingly, is akin to being a deity. Kenneth stood up as a replacement for Colimo as a captain of the Boys Club, a not so loose formation of power for business figures covering business, banking, journalism, and telecommunication. The invitation only club had a, powerful to, a power to decide some Kenyan fates and deployed properly could have blocked Sonko's ascendance. The other funeral was that of Ezra Bunyanyezi, the Dibona Ugandan businessman who had provided seed money for the founding of what became Radio Africa Group. In his past life, Bunyanyezi had supplied Janet Museven with a car to take her kids to school in Nairobi as her husband was waging the liberation war back in Uganda. He was one of two businessmen who financed the building of a bridge to assist Paul Kagame, a ragtag Rwandan patriotic front, to make their way to Kigali and he bought an air ticket for Raila Odinga, Kenyan's prime minister, future then prime minister, who was on the run in the late 80s on his way to Oslo. In short, Bunyanyezi was end-wind in Africans' liberation story. By being at Bunyanyezi's funeral in a leading role as if a captain of a different boys club, Kenneth was showing the public that his 2017 bid for Nairobi governorship against Sonko came with serious support. Now, the story continues to get interesting. Make way, make it all go away. Sonko and Kenneth both ran under the colors of Jubilee Party, a product of a merger between Kenyatta's 2013 party and that of his deputy, William Ruto. As their competition intensified, Sonko's criminal past surfaced in the press, and disqualification looked likely. But then Sonko sought a late-night audience with Kenyatta. He reportedly broke down asking Kenyatta why he was betraying him when Sonko had stood with the president during his trial at the Hague. The police issued a certificate of good conduct by 8 a.m. the next morning and Sonko went ahead to win the party primaries. Kenneth cried fall but the horse had bottled, had bolted I mean. With the president action showing that Sonko had his ear, if not, he's backing the senior civil servant and their patrons and to back down slightly. And so, the uncertain condition Sonko would have a running mate of their choice, governor, and their deputies ran on a joint electoral ticket. This was meant to keep Sonko Matatu in check by pairing him with a sober mind, but more importantly, this was also meant to secure certain commercial interests. Politics mattered, but money mattered more. Polika Pigade fit the bill. A loyal protege who had cut his teeth in corporate Kenya. The plan was simple. Sonko would win the votes. Igade would govern with the head goal being to push Sonko out of office and allow the chosen few men to overrun Nairobi with Igade as the potential governor. Red that than fight Right then, Sonko played a real politic. He obliged to the demands of these arrayed against him, feigning a fragile bone homing with Igade throughout the campaign period. They would pull up for publicity photo shoot at Emmanuel Jumbo's Hatchler. Hatch Jumbo is Kenyatta's official photographer in an attempt to sell their newfound comradeship. In their circus of campaign videos, Zigade was the tall caricature, Bobby the short one. A video emerged of Zigade standing in a circle with a handful of middle-aged men, with each of them wearing a matching cheers baba, a cynical alliance given to sleeveless jackets worn by one of these middle-life crises approaching Nairobi males. And Exuberant together proposed a toast to his mates, most of whom were holding their black and yellow cans of Tusker, Kenyan's most popular beer. 
the other called it an Australian toast, and it went something like this. Here is to you, here is to me, the best of friends. We will always be, and if by chance we disagree, we will. <laughs> F-word-you. Here is to you, generals, perhaps the toast usually ends with here is to me. First, a victory then control. Yeah, you heard me. They wanted the first victory, then to control the city. Now let me get down to this. In the moment of shame, when Song found himself. Now, le let me get back to this. In Fami, they have got it in for me. With control seemingly total, after Song won the 20. 17 general election. On Saturday morning in April 2018, they went too far. A gang of heavily built enforcers stormed into Hotel Bellavard in downtown Nairobi and violently disrupted a presser being addressed by the Dema Chimu de Morioki, a former boss of the Nairobi Central, Dis Central Business District Association, considered an insequential movie critic who needed to be taught a lesson. The men wrapped up. Morioki as a as journalist scapan. Grabbing Morioki by the waistline, one attacker in a grey hoodie attempted to throw the suited up Morioki into the hotel swimming pool, desperately kicking and pushing Morioki eventually freed himself from the man from the man's grip as journalists begged the attackers to not drown him. Please read my statement, Morioki pleaded. I wasn't attacking the governor. Focused on the sole mission of ganging Morioki and dispersing the press, the goons frog marched Morioki out of the compound. They shoved him into a pad of mud and he fell. Morioki managed to get back on his feet and attempt a sprint, only for the assaulters to snatch his blazer and assume their kicks and blows. Morioki escaped when the journalist convinced convinced guns at a nearby building to grant him refuge. Bellabad episode was one of the most embarrassing form of public humiliation Kenyans had ever witnessed. And it was done in Bovi's name. One of the attackers had invoked his name. More of them were subsequently seen in Bovi's outrage. Now, in the moment of shame, anger, and hopelessness, as they watched Morioki's assault live, streamed on social media, many Nairobians would have agreed that electing Sonko with his umatat was a blunder. The civil servants and businessmen who had failed to dislodge him decided to try again. The next attempt used Sonko's paranoia, fearing that City Hall was burned. Sonko os oscillated the running of Nairobi's affairs between an nod script pied City Harper Hill area which he converted into a personal office, and his gigantic hilltop Moa Hills mansion filled with in-your-face gold furnishing law located in the outskirts of Nairobi. Sonko summoned his cabinet for meetings in these private dwellings. Using the press response, Sonko detractors sponsored one unflattering airline after another to a point at which Sonko declared he was a target of Kenyan's deep state domicile at the office of the president, once again naming permanent secretary Karanja Kibich as the puppet master. Before the ink could dry on these damaging stories, that he drank at work around city hall like mafia boss, never listened to his cabinet and was going broke, the country's anti-corruption agency struck. Various transactions in Sonko bank accounts were flagged as, a, as suspicious, particularly in instances in which Sonko had previously received payments from companies that later on traded with City Hall. To Gatelli's operation, Sonko Upper Hill Base was placed under investigation on account that it had been acquired irregularly. Determination to fight back in May 2019, a fire fired at Sonko pulled up at a TV station carrying more than a hundred title deeds and 150 long books, intent on proving he was already a world man before going into politics. A teary-eyed song contributed this 
trouble to the Kenyan aristocracy, which he said was displeased that a poor man's son had risen to become Nairobi governor and was willing to share his murder earnings with people of his class. Mm. The fall of Sonko. On the night of February 2020, for 20, February 24th, 2020, Sonko received communication someone summoning him to State House, the President's office's official residence. He arrived two hours late for the 6 a.m. meeting Kenyatta had left. When Kenyatta returned that afternoon, the President instructed Sonko to surrender a number of Nairobi County functions to the national government, including but not limited to planning healthy transport, public works, ancillary service, and revenue collection. A consolation, Sonko would remain the governor Albert Lan Lameda Kwan. Now, the story continues until Sonko mistook Kenyatta for Nico. Speaking as a roadside rally in Machakos in February, he played Kenyatta's speech on loudspeaker before calling the president a drunkard with whom he used to smoke marijuana weed. I won't mention his name because if I do, he will either get me arrested or killed. That is his problem. Sonko said. But what my friend is now saying is that he is the one who introduced me to Google back when we used to smoke marijuana together. He taught me to put on Google to hide my bloodshot eyes after smoking. He taught me about Google's drinking and marijuana. Sonko Zumachat had finally crossed the president's red line. Yeah, you get what I mean. So Sonko was arrested for two eight hours later and held in custody for over a month. A charge with terrorism, the state alleged that Sonko runs a private militia that poses a threat to national security. Umatatu had worked for Sonko until he did it, and those that he sought to defeat, the businessmen and the hereditary politicians,